Okay. Uh, um, so I'm going to start by talking about, or I guess I should say, um, yeah, I'm sorry we, I had to go back on Zoom. Oh, excuse me. Uh, I hope we'll be back in person soon. I don't. I don't know for sure. Um, all right. Um, so I'm gonna pick up where I left off last time because I was about to discuss simple modes. Um, right. So remember. <clears throat> A simple mode a simple mode is a type of complex idea, which is confusing. So there's three main kinds of complex ideas, modes, ideas of substance, substances, and relations. And under modes, there's simple modes and mixed modes. And simple modes, so here's the definition of definition of simple mode. It's book two, chapter 12, section five on page 160. Of these modes, there are two sorts which deserve distinct consideration. First, there are some which are only variations or different combinations of the same simple idea without the mixture of any other as a dozen or score. All right, I'm gonna stop reading there. Um, so, um, so at least one way of, um, we have of, forming a simple a uh, simple mode is to combine the same simple idea over and over again to get a bigger one so like if we have the idea of unity we can there's the idea of unity we can have it like I don't know what what these symbols are <laughs> anyway you can have the idea of unity like several times in a row, and then we get the idea of a number, like a dozen or a score. I think he likes to use uh, he likes to use numbers that where you have a special name for that number, right? Like to emphasize that it's its own idea, a, the idea of a dozen. But I guess it's supposed to apply to numbers in general. Um, um however it seems like that's not the only way that we form simple modes so i mean <clears throat> first of all as you go on in the discussion of simple modes so like after space and time he starts discussing other simple modes and all of a sudden, it seems like it's not exactly the same idea. That it's sometimes just the same kind of idea. So that he discusses like the combination of musical notes into it to make a tune as a simple mode. Um, uh, and then the chapter on power, um, which was part of the reading for today also goes under simple modes because he's talking about the modes of power. I'm not sure what the simple modes of power are supposed to be. Um, but all right, so 
like leaving aside those weird or simple modes where it's not really the same idea over and over again. And I'm not sure how different it is from a complex, from sorry, from a mixed mode. Um, uh, and considering just these, like the main examples of simple modes, which are space, time, and number. So in the case of number, this idea that the way you form a simple mode is by taking a single idea and repeating it um, seems to work. But how is the get that going to work? And this is the question I left hanging at the end last time. How is get that going to work in the case of continuous quantity like space or time? Um, and um well of course you might think that and so remember and Locke says space is a simple idea we have comp oh, I wrote this too high up. so we have complex ideas versus simple ideas. And one example of a simple idea is space. Unity is also an example of a simple idea, or one. Right, remember the idea of one or unity was one of the ideas that he says comes in with every other idea somehow. Um, so, so you might think, so like, what is the simple idea of space? So if it's parallel to this, like you might think that, the, that this is the idea of space. And then you get an idea of a bigger space by adding these together. So that the idea of space would be simple because it's the idea of the smallest space that can't be divided. Um, and so every space would be composed of a bunch of these simple ideas added together, only, of course, you can add them like in different directions somehow. That's a little bit weird, but in any case, <laughs> um, uh, somehow you would get the ideas of bigger spaces by adding these little ones together and the little ones would be simple. So um, Barclay and at least Hume in the treatise are gonna look at our ideas of space that way, right? They're gonna say there must be a smallest idea and we that's simple and we you add that together to get ideas of extension. Um, but Locke says we can't form an idea of the smallest space. So Josephine says like an atom of space, quantum foam or some, well, <laughs> uh, um, so uh, remember, well, I, I shouldn't say too much about this because I put it off to when we discuss Hume and Barclay. But, but remember, Barclay doesn't think there's a distinction to be made between our ideas and the objects of our ideas. There's just ideas, right? So the smallest extension is the smallest idea of extension. So it's the smallest point you can imagine or see. So it's not like quantum foam or an atom. It's it's kind of like an atom of space, but it's, you know, um, it's an atom of, of visible. Well, I guess really it should be an atom of tangible space. Um, in Berkeley in particular, it's weird how he keeps switching to thinking in vision terms when uh, Barclay, of all people, should know that it's really the tangible terms that are primary here. Um, but right, so the smallest, like, perceptible space is the smallest space. 
So it's it's rather large, actually, compared to these things that Josephine is mentioning, like the plank length or something like that, right? Because the plank length is much too small to see. And Barclay says there can't be something too small to see. Because that thing would have to be different from our idea. And there are no objects of our ideas that are different from our ideas. Right, so Barclay at some point says something like, there is no such thing as the 10,000th part of an inch. It's a little bit complicated because how many parts an inch has actually depends on, well, I guess if you're thinking about a tangible inch, yeah, maybe that's, Still, it depends on how sensitive your your organ is, which in in our case is different in different parts of the body, right? Like your fingertips are the well, actually, your the tip of your tongue is the has, has the be best spatial resolution, and, and after that, it's your fingertips. Whereas some parts of your body, like your back or whatever. Yeah, so I don't know. Anyway, but yeah, so Barclay says there's no such thing as a 10,000th part of an inch, meaning like you shouldn't think of this as really, really tiny. Now, I mean, Hume, it's going to get more complicated, uh, but so I won't get into that. All right. But anyway, that's not Locke's view, right? Locke says, just as we can't form the idea of the biggest space, we can't form the idea of the smallest space. Our, our idea of of a space is always of something divisible. So what is the simple idea of space? And I think the answer is, and I think there's some people who are in 106 and in this class. Uh, I'm sure there are, right. So for those who, who are in 106, you just hold, heard me talking about kind of the same thing in Kant. And I mean, Kant follows Locke in a lot of ways, so it's not a coincidence here or anything. But so what I think is that the simple idea of space is just supposed, so to speak, the idea of like spaciness. It's not the idea of the smallest space. And the simple modes of space um, are limitations of the simple idea of space. So therefore, the, I, that simple idea of space never comes in by itself. <laughs> Barclay could explain that. All right. But never mind. Anyway, um, um, sorry, I'm responding to chatter in the in the chat. Um, the simple idea of space never comes in by itself. Obviously, if that's right, is what we perceive is always a mode of space because it's always some limited space. Um, and so, uh, how does it come in? Well, so Locke says, this is book two, chapter 13, section two on page 162. Um, Men perceive by their sight a distance right so what we perceive is space plus limit i probably i should say something about the word man It's always going to be bad, a bad time for a digression. Um, so most of the time when Locke says man or men, he doesn't mean men as opposed to women. Like in this case, for example, right? So when he says men perceive by their sight a distance, of course, he doesn't mean that women or members of other genders, but I don't think that's really on his... 
radar. So he doesn't mean that uh, that women don't perceive by their sight a distance. Um, however, uh, well, then again, sometimes he does mean men as opposed to women. Um, and, you know, um, that that term man has like always been double-edged in English. Um, I think we'll actually see a place where Locke even takes advantage of that. That is actually uses the fact that he can, he can, without your noticing it exactly, make a transition from using man to mean human being to using man to mean man as opposed to woman. Um, so uh, it's, um, um, I think it's always been a dangerous word. And like, this is, I'm trying to steer a course here between saying, every time he says men, we could we should say, ah, oh, he means men instead of women. No, he doesn't mean that. But on the other hand, it's not innocent. It's, I mean, and we can't we can't go back and correct it, obviously, like change every place he says man into human being, because then we would miss, like, as I, if I'm right, that actually some places he's using that ambiguity. And like, this is a story I like to tell, and this is not about Locke, but about Tolkien, that, um, you know, there's a prophecy that the Lord of, about the Lord of the Nazgul that, like, no man will destroy him or something like that. So, uh, so in the end, you find out that it's a woman who destroys him and a hobbit. <laughs> Forget about the hobbit part. Right. So no man will destroy him. So it's like a riddle, right? You know, like it's, you know, when you, when you hear no man can destroy me you or no man can destroy him you think it means no one can destroy him but then you find out oh no it meant man as opposed to woman right so like if you were to go back and correct and insert human being every place it says man so this is the story i that i i knew someone who was uh, a pretty big tolkien fan but he didn't uh his english was not very good and he had only ever read tolkien in hebrew and uh and he didn't understand the the riddle like he had some other theory about why the prophecy didn't come out because <laughs> they like in translating it they had to choose choose between a word that definitely meant man as opposed to woman and a word that definitely didn't um so anyway so that's just a way of saying that like on the one hand we can't ignore this like there's 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 something um um there's something uh there's something strange about that word and about the masculine pronouns that go along with it and whatever but especially about that word um so uh um we can't ignore it, but like we can't stop to, I, I can't stop to remark on it every time. So this is the time I'm going to stop to remark on it, except, as I said, when we get to the place where I feel like Locke is actually doing something with it. Okay, so anyway, that was all big digression. I, I just, it was just because I read the sentence, men perceive by their sight a distance, right? So that is, um, again, what we see actually is the simple idea of space plus well, I mean, plus, of course, the idea of unity, that always comes in, and the idea of existence, and the idea of limit. This is one reason that I feel like limit also maybe should be added to that list of simple ideas that come in with every idea. Um, Um, yeah, there's someone saying something 
Oh, Enoch is saying something about the use of man in Old English. I don't, I don't know. Um, I know that in German, man means man as opposed to woman. And the word, the neutral word is mensch, but I don't know what the etymology of mensch is. Anyway, sorry, that's, this is all <laughs> um, pretty off topic. Um, right. So, uh, so like we, it comes in with the idea of unity and the idea of the idea of limit and the idea of unity. And so we take that as the unit. Right? So we get a simple mode of space that we can use as a unit. And using that unit, we can build up bigger. That's, I guess, why I put these little parentheses here, but they have no place. To... All right, here's where they belong. <laughs> right? That is, once we get this idea, which is, it's, but this idea is not simple. This is a simple mode, but it's not a simple idea. It's a complex idea, right? Because again, the simple mode is a type of complex idea. So we get this complex idea, which is the simple mode of space, which is just the simple idea of space, which is just like what all spaces have in common. And then, but with the idea of a particular limit to it. And then we can make this idea into a unit and we can use it to build up bigger ones, right? So that's what Locke is talking about when he says like how from the idea, so many ideas of a perch, we form the idea of a furlong or whatever, whatever those units are. Um, uh, wait, so is there a simple idea of space? Yes, I mean, there's definitely a simple idea of space. Right, like the section of space talks starts by talking about the simple that there's a, there's an idea of space. Right, I, actually, I'll go back. It's it's the same paragraph I was just reading, um, book two, chapter thirteen, section two, on page one sixty two. I shall begin with the simple idea of space. I have showed above that we get the idea of space both by our sight and our touch. Oh yeah, it says chapter four, but I. I wrote here that it, maybe it should say chapter five. All right, anyway, which I think is so evident that it would be need, as needless to go to prove that men perceive by their sight a distance, right? So men perceive by their sight a distance is the way we get the simple idea of space. So... Um, So what goes on in this perceiving by sight a distance? And again, like it would probably be better if he explained how we perceive by touch a distance. But although he mentions both sight and touch in this paragraph, the like exam the detailed explanation mentions colors and sight, not touch. But right, so how does this how does this perceiving by sight a distance work? Well, like space, that is the thing that the idea of space is an idea of. Um I think has no power to cause any sensation in us because it offers no resistance. That's the definition of space. Right? So space itself is, doesn't have any power to cause any simple idea in us. So the idea of space is something we get by perceiving, well, either the distance between two bodies or the distance between parts of the same body. Oh, 
Okay, so Enoch yes, asks, is one distance unit of space a simple idea or a simple mode? Well, so there isn't such thing as a distance unit of space in general, right? That is, there are units that you can use to measure space, like feet, inches, whatever, right? Now, I mean, you can build bigger units out of smaller units, but that's you couldn't have used that to get the idea of any distance at all in the first place. Because again, to do that, you would have to have a smallest unit, and that's exactly what Locke says we don't have. So any particular unit of distance you choose is, is never a simple idea. It's always a simple mode. But it always involves the simple idea of space. So, um, you might, I mean, I think maybe one thing that's confusing about this is you might say, what do you mean this isn't simple? It has all these parts, right? Like, in other words, if I got, forget about this case, because in this case, we have to like basically ignore the features of the body that are there. So let's just take this case where there's two bodies and nothing in between them. And either by sight or by touch, we perceive a distance here. So, right, so like, I'll just let me write some respect. So here's the mind. And we're, we're, we're getting some kind of idea here. Meaning, getting an idea is always means that something causes us to perceive the idea. So what idea does it cause us to perceive? So here's, the, here's what the external object looks like. I mean, based on what I said last time, which we should really say is something like, that the external object is somehow analogous or isomorphic to, to this picture that I'm drawing, right? Like the picture itself is an idea, <laughs> um, but never mind that, right? So just say, this is what the external object is like. What kind of idea does this cause in us? Now, I mean, it causes a number of ideas, right? Because like this body causes an idea of it's, various ideas based on its qualities and this one does so forth but we're focusing on the idea of a distance that we get from it. so like somehow this configuration and it has to be due to the to the to the superficies as Locke would say of the bodies right to the surfaces of the bodies that somehow I get the idea of um, let me not draw it like that. Because I don't want to draw another version of this picture. I think that that will just increase the confusion here. The idea I get is the idea I get is the simple idea of space plus. an idea of limit, right? That is, it's, I guess this is also like a mode of the idea of limit somehow, right? Because it's it's the shape essentially of the space is what this this idea is, right? So it's, it's limits, you know, like what its limits are like. So, this is not necessarily a simple idea, although I think limit itself, Locke also says somewhere is a simple idea. So it's like a mode of the simple idea of limit. But this space is a simple idea, according to Locke. Now, you might ask, how can this distance here be? So, so the idea of limit represents this, the edges of it. So this simple idea of space has to represent the in between the limitsness of the space. <laughs> and you might say, how can it do that? Because doesn't this space have lots of parts and this idea is simple? 
And I think the answer is Locke says, and we'll see this uh, much more explicitly in Hume, but I think Locke already agrees with this. So, um, uh, namely, I think Locke says, it's not true. This doesn't have parts. Um, so uh, I know that's a weird thing to say, but let me read what he says on uh, in section 13 on page 166 to 167. To divide and separate actually is, as I think, by removing the parts one from another to make two superficies where before there was a continuity. And to divide mentally is to make in the mind two superficies where before there was a continuity. And consider them as removed one from the other, which can only be done in things considered by the mind as capable of being separated and by separation of acquiring new distinct superficies, right? So actually dividing something means actually... Actually dividing something means you have a continuity, and now you make two superficies, that is, surfaces, where before there was a continuity, and you remove these things from each other. That's actually dividing. Now he says dividing mentally just means that you take this thing that actually remains continuous, and you like imagine making two superficies in it and moving the parts, the, the two pieces apart. And he says um, that mental separation can only be done um, which can only be done in things considered by the mind as capable of being separated and by separation of acquiring new distinct superficies, which they then have not, but are capable of, right? So the mind, uh, this, as I said, uh, to begin with, Locke's style can be uh, difficult. <laughs> you keep getting another, like, comma and another part that you didn't know was coming. Um, let me read it again. Which can only be done in things considered by the mind as capable of being separated and by separation of acquiring new distinct superficies, which they then have not, but are capable of. Right, so that I can only mentally separate something when I consider it possible for it to, for pieces of it to be separated and removed from each other. But neither of these ways of separation, whether real or mental, is, as I think, compatible to pure space. Right? So space is not divisible, Locke is saying. When this is, if this is completely empty, it has no parts. Why do we think of it as having parts? Um, well, basically because we can put a body in here that has parts and it won't meet any resistance. So as I said, Locke is going to, I mean, Hume is going to say more about that when he talks about the possibility of a vacuum. Um, but I think that's already Locke's view, right? So that's why this simple idea is, is enough to represent what's in between here, because what's in between here is um, emptiness. And it's all the same. It doesn't have different parts, right? Because it, if it had different parts, it would be possible to move them apart from each other. But you obviously can't do that with the parts of space. You can only do that with the parts of bodies. So in particular, when when like when Locke says we don't have an idea of the smallest space, um, means like we don't have an idea of a space where you couldn't 
like move these closer together or that is where you couldn't move them in such a way that a smaller, only a smaller body could fit. <laughs> um, but he doesn't actually say space is infinitely divisible. When he talks about infinite divisibility, he says body is infinitely divisible because again, body is infinitely divisible according to him, but space isn't divisible at all. Okay, that's all I want to say about space. Are there, first of all, have more questions come in here? Oh, yeah, it was Josephine answering Enoch. And yeah, basically, I think you have the, you, you have the right idea, according to me, anyway. <laughs> Hopefully, if I'm right, the right idea according to Locke. All right. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk about infinity, unless, again, people have questions about space. Um, like, as, as I said, I think this is, I mean, this is going to be important, first of all, to understand, like, what Hume is saying about space in the treatise, and then, but it's also... Uh, important for understanding later, understanding what Kant says about space. Um, that, I mean, Locke is going to say we have no idea of infinite space. And that is, we have no idea of space infinite. <laughs> that is, we have no idea of all of the infinity of space as one thing. Um, and that's true if by infinite you mean what he does, which I'm about to go on to discuss. But in a certain way, um, this simple idea of space is the idea of infinite space. That is, it's the idea of space in abstraction from any limitations. And I think, in fact, this is what Spinoza means when he talks about the infinity of the divine attribute of extension. He doesn't mean it's really, really big. He means it's prior to all limitation. Um, and I think it's the same thing Kant means when he says that space is infinite and the transcendental aesthetic. All right. Um, but never mind that. More about Locke on infinity. Because, well, I, I mean, that is kind of a segue, actually, because. Um, um, because the point of Locke's discussion of infinity is to avoid thinking of infinity as something that precedes all limitations. And yet, in fact, if you pay attention to his theory of space, it actually got back in there, I think, <laughs> in a way. It's just, that's not what he calls infinite. All right. So his discussion of infinity begins with this important claim which maybe I think to us seems kind of obvious um so right so this is chapter 17 section one on page 199 finite and infinite seem to me to be looked upon by the mind as the modes of quantity and to be attributed primarily in their first de designation only to those things which have parts and are capable of increase or diminution by the addition or subtraction of any of the least part. And such are the ideas of space, duration, and number. Hmm. So here is saying that space does have parts, but I think that, again, that means um, if you go back to where he talks about um, the, divis the why people think space is divisible, I think you'll see that space having parts means, you know, that space has room in it for multiple bodies, basically, right? Um, Um, or, well,
Maybe I shouldn't put it that way. The units of space can be added together to make bigger units of space. Maybe there's something I don't understand about that. The units can be added to get... They can't really be added because they can't really be separated. The ideas can be added. So actually, no, I think last time when I first talked about adding the idea of unity, like adding a bunch of them together to get the idea of five or whatever, that um, it's not clear where, like, what is, what do you mean that it's like you have the same idea again? Like, like what makes these not just that, the this, this same idea? Right, so that there's only one, not two. I mean, it seems like they have to be put next to each other somewhere, but where? And I guess, like, it seems when you talk about adding units of space, it seems like, well, at least you don't have that problem because it's clear where they can be put next to each other, namely in space, right? So you just put one on the end of the other. But I think really what I was what I was just worrying about here shows that this is pretty much as mysterious as this. That you know, because it's not really true that the big space has a bunch of parts that are identical to the smaller space. It's but it's somehow that when you when you consider that five of the smaller spaces together, <laughs> you can form the idea of the bigger space. Um Okay, but never mind that. I'm sorry. I'm trying to figure out something on the fly. All right. Let me go back to the discussion of infinity. Again, this is on page 199. Oh, I'm sorry. And I was just drawing stuff on the board and you couldn't see it, right? Oops. This is what I was talking about. I was right. I was saying, like, these five units, where are they? Why, why isn't each one exactly the same as the others? So there's only one. Somehow we arrange them next to each other in the mind, but not literally next to each other, right? Maybe it is literally next to each other. But anyway, he's not presupposing that here because he's not, right? He, he keeps saying he doesn't want to decide those questions about mind-body relationship. So... And then I was saying that when you add together these five units, it might seem like this is easier to understand, but it's actually just as mysterious in a way. Okay. Anyway, what I was the the thing I just read about infinity is him saying that that finite and infinite are primarily types of quantity. Now, um, like I said, that might seem kind of obvious to us. Like we usually we usually think of finite and infinite as types of quantity. Um, Although when I talked about the, the simple idea of space being in a sense infinite, I was not thinking of finding an infinite as type of quantity, right? I was starting to think of it more abstractly as the infinite is what precedes limitation. Um, so it's not bigger. <laughs> um, but uh, but so but Locke is is defining or is claiming that our ordinary idea of finite and infinite, that is what we express by the words finite and infinite, is primarily a mode of quantity. So um, that's a direct challenge to Descartes' idea of the infinite. Right in the third meditation, Descartes says, I find in myself an idea of the infinite. Um, and then the proof is that I couldn't have such an idea unless its object, which is God, exists. Right. And there, the idea of the infinite doesn't mean like lots and lots. <laughs> 
It's not supposed to be specific, somehow specifically about quantity. So um, Locke is undermining that, right, when he says that. And that's why the very next thing he goes on to discuss right after he says that is the attributes of God, right? He says, "'Tis true that we cannot but be assured that the great God of whom and from whom are all things is incomprehensibly infinite." But yet, when we apply to that first and supreme being our idea of infinite, in our weak and narrow thoughts, we do it primarily in, spec in respect of his duration and ubiquity. Right? So saying, like, there isn't some absolute understanding of infinity that only applies to God. When we think, when we call God infinite, we just mean he's everywhere and at all times. And there's an infinite number of places and times, so he's infinite. Um, so, um, and then he goes on to say, like, when we say God is infinitely good or infinitely powerful, then it's more indirect, right? Like, we're talking about the infinite quantity of the effects of his power or something like that. Um, so that's part of his challenge to Descartes here. Um, and the second part of the challenge comes in the second section of that chapter. Um, because so, uh, roughly speaking, Descartes, like the way the third meditation proof works is that Descartes says, um, so we have this idea of the infinite. And we can form the idea of a finite thing only by adding limitations to it. So we must have the idea of the infinite before we have the idea of any finite thing. So it must be a priori. And in fact, it must be innate, as, as Descartes and Locke understand it anyway. Right, like we, so to speak, literally had to have it before we could get any the idea of anything finite. <laughs> um, so like and that, and that's what Descartes means when he says that it's like the stamp of my maker that has been left on me, the idea of the infinite, etc. Okay, but um, but as opposed to Locke, who says. There's no problem how we get the idea of the finite. Right? So again, like the, the structure of the argument in Descartes is something like, I have the idea of something finite, namely myself, right? Because I doubt, so I'm finite. Because doubting means that there's something I want to know that I don't. So that's like a limit. It's not a quantit... Well, I guess it is kind of a quantitative limit, right? There's a number of things that I want to know that I don't. But in any case, right, so I have the idea of something finite, but I couldn't have the idea of something finite unless I already had the idea of something infinite. I, I guess I still haven't left, I still haven't put in the part where the object of the idea of the infinite must exist, that I couldn't have got that idea for myself or whatever. But, um, but that's the key part of the proof, right? I have the idea of something finite, and it can only be derived from a previous idea of something infinite. So like what Locke demands that I must that I must have the consciousness that I'm kind of remembering that idea of the infinite, that I'm not having it for the first time. I think in a way Descartes thinks that's right. Every time I have the idea of something finite, it's against the background of already having the idea of something infinite. So I'm, so to speak, remembering it. Okay, but in any case, so Locke, um, to disrupt that whole argument says, no, we don't get the idea of the finite by starting with the idea of the infinite and limiting it. How do we get the idea of the finite? Um, actually, we don't have to wait for Hume for the Locke's to, <laughs> doctrine of space to become relevant. Here it is right away, it's being applied. The obvious portions of extension that affect our senses, carry with them into the mind the idea of finite. 
Right. Oh, so for once, I I I, I do regret having erased something. <laughs> That picture I had before of the two bodies and men see a distance and whatever, that's where we get the idea of the finite, because the idea, simple idea of space doesn't come in by itself, but with the idea of a limit. And the idea of limit is the idea of finitude, right? Finitude is limitation. So Locke says, um, it's not innate, but... Well, but we get it with every single experience, right? <laughs> that I, I think you know, like that's, um, um. Well, okay, no, maybe. All right. So Locke says the idea of finite is not innate, but it's close enough to innate because it comes with every experience, right? As soon as we, the first thing we experience are the obvious portions of extension, and um, and every one of them you know, brings in the idea of limit with it. So we have the idea of, of a limited space from experience. And then, right, so we don't need to have first had an idea of the infinite. Although, again, as I pointed out, like, in a way, you could say if if you understand infinite, if you go back to understanding the infinite the way Spinoza does, or you could say that you do have the idea. But I mean, but but nevertheless, Locke said. Remember, Locke explained how we get the simple idea of space from experience too, right? It's not innate. Although, again, it comes in right away. Right, like you can't have any experience without it. So, in any case, so that leaves Locke free to try to explain how we get the idea of the infinite from the idea of the finite rather than the other way around. Okay, so Josephine says, when I read when I read this, it seemed very plausible to see it as opening a door for atheism in comparison to Descartes and rationalism. We can have ideas without God. Was this cause for criticism or censure when Locke was alive? Um, well, yeah, um, so Locke was criticized from that direction. Uh, I don't know if I've read, but I assume that some of the criticisms aimed at this in particular. Um, um, I mean, so we'll see later on, Locke has a proof of the existence of God, and it seems like his his ethics depends on it. Um, so, I mean, unless you claim that he secretly means to convey a different message, which you can, you know, philosophers do that, I guess. Uh, don't feel like that's plausible in this case, but I'm sure uh, you can find someone who disagrees with me. <laughs> um, but, but in any case, so like I would say, at least certainly in terms of what Locke openly does in this book, I don't think he's not doing it for that reason. He just doesn't like Descartes' proof. I mean, he doesn't think it's a good proof, basically. He's going to try to supply a better one himself. It's it, the, the one he supplies is similar in structure, but it, but it works with different, with a different kind of imperfection of the world um, than finitude. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. Um, yeah, fair enough. You can open the door to an idea well, but I mean, to say that Locke opened the idea, I, door to the idea of atheism is like the idea of atheism is ancient. <laughs> I mean, you don't have to open a new door to it. Um, 
uh, and criticizing a particular proof of the existence of God is like is also ancient. Um, I mean, is it the case that this particular criticism, let's say, is especially used by Hume or something? I don't think so, actually. Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. All right. Um, um, so, so I guess the answer is, I don't know. It's not clear. <laughs> okay. Um, um, but, it, but it, it does seem clear to me that he's attacking Descartes here. Um, now, I mean, uh, there's some weird things about uh, about the way, right? So like what I started to say before is, so given that Locke's, right? So in Descartes, you have to have the idea of the infinite first. And then from that, you can derive the idea of the finite. But Locke says, we get the idea of the finite from experience. And then he has to explain how we derive from that the idea of the infinite. Um. And there's a lot of weird and interesting things about his explanation, which I could spend a long time talking about, but I will not because I want, I still haven't caught up to where we're supposed to be at the end last time. So I'll, I'll just say that um, the, the basic, the main point of his explanation is that we do have an idea of the infinite, but our idea of the infinite is something like always more than whatever finite quantity you you specify so um it's the it's it, it's it's the idea of um being able to add up finite things plus the negation of there being anything that will stop you something like that so that means we never, like, as I was saying, he says, like, we have an idea of the infinity of space, but not an idea of space infinite, right? That is, we have our idea of the infinity of, the, of space is that you can always go farther than any finite distance in space. So give any finite distance and I can go farther than it. But we don't have any idea of space infinite, meaning we don't have the idea of all of that finished and now we have infinitely much space. We don't have an idea of infinitely much anything. And like he he takes it as uh, obviously absurd to talk about an infinite number. Right, All no, although there is an infinity of numbers, every number is finite. And, and he says, when we talk, this, when we talk about um, the infinity of space, where we really mean that it, you know, spaces can be put in correspondence with numbers, <laughs> right? So uh, just as there's never an end to the numbers, there's never an end to spaces, but there's no infinite number and there's no infinite space. Um, of course, now we sort of think there are infinite numbers, although, uh, if you study set theory, you'll find out that in basically, is this safe to say? Probably not. For the most part, anyway, in axiomatic uh, versions of set theory, you have to add something called the axiom of infinity. And the axiom of infinity says that there's an infinite number. So it's not so much that we've discovered as those infinite numbers as we've just like <laughs> um, demanded them. <laughs>
Um, okay. Um, and I mean, we've demanded them because like, it makes it much easier to do, uh, well, to begin with, I guess you say, it makes it much easier to do calculus if you assume there are infinite numbers. Um, okay. Um, okay. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't think this is the time to, to talk about whether there are negative numbers, imaginary numbers, infinite numbers, whatever, even though there aren't, you can't have that many dollars. All right. I'm going to go on to talk about, there's so many things here. I'm not, obviously not going to get to all of them. But, um, I'll do my best. All right. So relations. This is not the same as the order in the book. So this is the order I'm going to talk about, although I have misgivings about that. Why did I want to put them in a different order? I don't know. But relations, substances, and mixed modes. And then power freedom and identity, right? So power is actually discussed under simple modes, as I said. Um, freedom is, is discussed under power and identity is discussed under relation. Um, if I don't get to this stuff, it will not be too bad because next time when we discuss moral relations like all of this stuff is going to come up again so um so if necessary i'll push it off to next time um so i'm just going to start by talking about relations in general and then something about substances and mixed modes um Okay, so what are relations? Um, So this is chapter 25, section one on page 288. Um, I guess I'll start here. When the mind considers one thing, that it does, as it were, bring it Right. Oh, say when the mind's so considered. No, let me not start there. All right. Okay. This is what relations are. The denominations given to positive things, intimating that respect and serving as marks to lead the thoughts beyond the subject itself denominated to something distinct from it are what we call relatives. Right, so a relative denomination so like um, denomination in general means that like you call something by a name derived from the name of its property. So in this case, let's say the property is um, being bigger than. 
So we're going to denominate this substance bigger than, actually, let me leave out the than. Being bigger, we're going to denominate this substance bigger. That is, we say, let's say this is Plato. We say Plato is bigger. <laughs> We denominate it um, in a way that intimates um, um, a certain respect and serves as a mark to lead the thoughts beyond the subject itself denominated. So let's say we're calling Plato bigger because Plato is bigger than Socrates. I think Plato was taller than Socrates. <laughs> I believe that's true. All right. Um, just because Socrates was known as, as short. Um, so, um, so although the denomination is applied to Plato, right? That is, we don't say like Plato and Socrates are bigger or the relationship between Plato and Socrates is bigger. We say Plato is bigger, but so we denominate Plato bigger from his being bigger, but it's his being bigger than something, namely, for example, Socrates. So it's a denomination that leads the thought beyond the thing denominated to something else. And it's based on this capability of the mind um, that is a kind of operation that the mind can carry out. Remember before, I think he said that this operation is called comparison. Um, the understanding in the consideration of anything is not confined to that precise object. It can carry any idea, as it were, beyond itself, or at least look beyond it to see how it stands in conformity to any other. It seems like he's talking about two different ways of, of looking at it here, right? Either it can carry the idea beyond itself, or at least, right? Like if it weren't for the at least, I might say that this or is, as we say, epexegetical or. Right, there's an or that means that is. Um, but with the at least, it seems like we're talking about two different alternatives. Um, but I don't know what the difference between them is supposed to be. So anyway, <laughs> and so the mind carries the idea or beyond itself or looks beyond it to see how it stands in conformity to any other. I think this is exactly the same operation that before he called comparison. And remember he said it was the, uh, it was this operation that's behind the whole tribe of our ideas that are called relations. Um, Actually, I guess I am going to discuss identity right away. Um, that was not the order I remembered. Well, that makes sense. Let me, because there's not that much to say about relation in general. Well, I mean, I guess, there, okay, there's a few things to say about it. So one is that, so the opposite of relative. So usually in philosophy, the opposite of relative is absolute. Right? So the opposite of a relative denomination would be an absolute denomination. So like when you say, um, um, so 
Socrates is white. Maybe that's a bad, that's a traditional example, right? To us, it sounds like it necessarily sounds racial, although that's not how they meant it. How did they mean it? They actually, uh, wait, we were just talking about people having different numbers of color terms and stuff. Was that in this class? I guess it was. Aristotle says that all colors are arranged between white and black. <laughs> Those are the extreme colors and the others are in between. <laughs> and they constantly are talk talking about people and other things and calling them black or white. And we would say, well, no, they're, they're kind of like brownish, right? <laughs> so um, I'm not sure what color he, but also like Socrates changes from black to white. So it means like pale or something. I don't know. Anyway, we say Socrates is white, or we say this pen is white. Um, we're not talking about, apparently, not talking about its relation to anything else. The thoughts are staying with the subject itself. So if that's right, then white is an absolute denomination. Locke usually... Although he does say absolute sometimes as the opposite of relative, usually the opposite of relative in Locke is positive. Um, I think, um, right, so whereas re relatio, right, latio means like moving. I don't think it actually was used in classical Latin on its own. It always has a prefix, but like translatio, right? Translation or so, right. So rel relatio means like moving, carrying the idea beyond itself. Whereas like positio, positio <laughs> means placing, <laughs> right? So like this kind of denomination just places the denomination in the thing. Whereas this kind carries it beyond the thing. Okay, so um, um, and the the tricky thing about relation is um, that um, um, it isn't always clear whether an idea is relative or, or positive. That is, we Locke says, and Locke's not the only one to say this, that um, we have ideas that seem to us to be positive, but when you think about them more carefully, you'll see that there's a tacit, right, that is silent relation involved in them. There's a relation we're not mentioning, right? So he gives two types, of, Locke gives two types of examples of this. One is, the kind that people call an external denomination. And one of the examples he gives of it is concubine. Right, so he, says, so he says, so Locke says, so, okay. So the idea of an external denomination is that it's absolute, but it's given by virtue of something else. Right, so like when you call someone a concubine, that can't be true unless they're related to someone else. So Locke says, this is just a tacit relation. There's no such thing as an external denomination. Um, and he says, like, why do we, why do we not notice that this is just a relative term, just as much as like husband or wife, right? Which everyone would agree are relative terms, right? When you denominate someone husband, 
it's like bigger. You carry the thought beyond them. The denomination is due to something else. I guess for a lot of something else is always a wife. Um, for us, something else might be another husband or whatever, right? But in any case, um, uh, in Locke's situation, I guess that made this particularly clear. Um, or like brother. You're called brother relative to someone else who's either your brother or your sister. Anyway, your sibling. Right. So Locke says in these cases where there's a term for the correlative, we notice that 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 this it's a relation. But in this case, where there's no special term for the correlative, right? Like there's no special term for the person who has a concubine. Then we start to think of this as a um as somehow absolute or positive, even though there's clearly a relation involved in it. Now, um, I think that one of his examples is concubine and another one of his examples is dictator or constable, right? So I think he's, there's, he's actually making some kind of political observation here. Um, Right, that that this is that there's a, there's actually something pernicious or can be in this failure to recognize that something is really a relation. We start to think that someone is a concubine or a dictator by their own nature, and don't realize that it takes two. <laughs> okay, um, uh, so that's one type of example he gives. Um, Another type of example he gives is like old. Um, also imperfect, which is an important example. Um, so, you know, but just take old, right? Or just take big. So forget bigger. Big is a good example of this. Let me have this all this. So suppose this is a big tree, and this is a small mountain. How can that be if the mountain is bigger than the tree? Well, it's because big and small, although they, they appear positive, like white and black, there's, they're actually, there's a hidden relation, right? They're tacitly relative. So when we call something big, we mean something like big compared to other things of that kind or around here or something like that, right? So, um, so it makes sense to say that the tree is big and the mountain is not big, but the mountain is bigger than the tree because the, the way it makes sense, the way you avoid the contradiction is to fill in those tacit relatives, right? So you say the tree is big compared to trees. The mountain is not big compared to mountains. And now there's no contradiction in saying the mountain is bigger than the tree. Okay, so I mean, that also, as you can see maybe from the example of imperfect is going to uh, potentially have serious implications it's especially going to have implications when it gets to a term like good or morally good, where there's, there's going to be a serious question. Is there a tacit relation or not? Can things be absolutely good or can or is do you always have to say good in relation to something? So we'll see next time what Locke's answer to that is. Um, okay, so anyway, that's one general kind of issue about relations. Are there questions about that? Were there questions about this? Oh, I don't know what was going on when when you asked, is this how abstraction to a universal idea works?
like when when you were like back a while ago with like mm -hmm. if we can tell that Socrates is bigger or Plato is bigger than Socrates, um, then we're relating modes of size in both of them, right? So is that how you oh, get sensible, specific ideas of size to a, a universal of the concept of size generally? It is it is part of the process, right? Remember, comparison was one of the steps on the way to abstraction. So yes, I think the answer is yes. Oh, Locke doesn't say that exactly. He he says things in a very confusing way, as you've mentioned. <laughs> um, all right, but yeah, I think that's right. But I mean. But obviously, before you have any abstract ideas, the the ideas of relation you form by comparison are concrete, or that is particular, right? So it's going to be like the I like you're going to be thinking of Plato as bigger than Socrates, not as the like the you, the relation of bigger than, which is itself abstract. Um, all right. Anyway, let me now uh, let me now change the subject. It's still going to talk about relations a little bit. Um, so um, the way Locke defines relation, a relation obviously always involves two things, right? A relation has two terms, as we say. Term means end right? Like terminus. So a, a relation always has two ends. It always has two terms um, because the whole, the, um, the capacity of the mind that we use in forming these ideas is to go out from one thing to something else. And like, in fact, that's the title of section six of chapter 25 uh relation only betwixt two things all right so relation is always between two things but this causes a problem with one particular relation namely identity that is sameness Right, and I, I always have to emphasize this because we now use identity to mean other things, right? But like, right, when you ask, like, uh, you know, when you say um, my Jewish identity or something like that, right? That doesn't mean, I mean, it must, it has some relation originally to this word, but it's, it doesn't mean sameness. But this word originally, right, idem, is the Latin word for same. And identitas means sameness. So when Locke talks about identity, he's talking about sameness, right? And so when he talks about personal identity, as he's going to next time, he means, like, when are two things the same person? And when are they different people? Right. So identity is supposed to be a relation of sameness. In case that didn't make sense, like when would you ask that? Like at two different times, right? So you want to know, like, like, you know, uh, these days it usually comes up with these science fiction thought experiments. You know, like my body is disassembled here and reassembled somewhere else by a teleportation machine. Is it the same person or a different person who got reassembled there? Right, so that's a question about personal identity. All right, so, but just thinking about identity in general, so things are only the same as themselves, <laughs> obviously. So it seems like identity is a relation where there's only one thing. Right, how can something be related to itself? Is it that the understanding carries the idea out beyond itself and back to itself? So, 
So um, basically, um, yes, according to Hegel, <laughs> right? So according to Hegel, the absolute, that is the non-relative, is the carrying of the um, of something beyond itself and back to itself. But that is not Locke's. <laughs> All right. So goodbye, Hegel. All right. So, um, so according to Locke, how can there be this relation between uh, the same thing and itself? And the answer is, um, and this is chapter 27, that is book two, chapter 27, section one on page 296. When considering anything as existing at determined at, at any determined time and place, we compare it with itself existing at another time and thereon form the ideas of identity and diversity. Right? So that example I gave of myself at two different times is all examples of identity and diversity are like that, according to Locke. The way you um, get a relationship between a thing and itself, so you sort of have two things, but you sort of have only one thing, is that you consider, so if this is time and this is space, you're always asking, is this the same as this? Whereas, if you consider it at exactly one time, Locke says, um, well, Locke isn't as clear about this as Hume will be, um, because he still sometimes says something like, it's the same. But I think the idea is, when we see anything to be in any place in any instant of time, we are sure, be it what it will, that it is that very thing and not another which at that same time exists in another place. That is, there is no question about identity of the thing in a place at a time, um, we're very sure that it's that thing and not anything else, right? So it's like the, I, the really, as Hume is going to say, what the idea we get from just one thing is unity, not identity. But identity comes when we have this kind of two-ness, but we also, in some other way, are thinking of it as one. Um, so, um, so time and space are, um, two different necessary parts of this, of the answer here, or, or I mean, they play two different necessary roles here. Like it's what makes this question possible is that, um, there can't be two things at the same place at the same time, nor can one thing be at two places, like for example, the body of Christ, nor can, can, can't be at two places at the same time. So, you know, if you, if this is the same as this, then since there was only one thing here, Nothing else at this time can be the same as this. Um. 
Um, see that. Right. So, um, so I'm not going to say more in general in detail about what he says about this relation of identity, because like I said, I'm going to talk about that next time when I talk about personal identity in particular. Personal identity is a central topic in Locke's ethics, because um, since it will turn out that ethics or morality is, is tied to reward and punishment, um, the, the key question is going to be, like, who can be punished now for things that were done earlier? It has to be the same person. Um, so I'll talk about that next time. Um, and so, Some Chinese Marxist philosophy uses identity and unity as synonyms. Don't they use Chinese words? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, all right. Oh, uh, in other words, is that a problem with the with their terminology or with the translation? But yeah, identity and unity are not synonyms. Um. Okay, so the question is, that was everything I wanted to say about, oh, and Zoe says ship of Theseus. Yes, exactly. And a, like a ship is going to be one of Locke's examples of the, um, or no, actually, is it a ship? I think it's more general. It's just like some kind of machine or something. He talks about replacing all the parts. Um and he wants to explain how it can still be the same. Um, okay, so the question is, should I try to start talking about mixed modes and substances? Um, okay, so I'm going to say this much about ideas of substances. So the origin of the supposed idea of substance. Now, like when I say supposed, it's a little ambiguous whether Locke thinks this is a legitimate idea or not. Sometimes he seems to almost say we have no such idea. But other times he seems to say we do, but it's um, defective in certain ways. Um, and yet we can't do without it. Um, so, uh, um, I think, in fact, when he talks about freedom of the will, it's going to be clear that he can't do without it. So I go, I, t I lean more towards that. But anyway, so the origin of this supposed idea of substance is that, first of all, we find that certain ideas, quote, go constantly together. This is, uh, I'm not going to read it from in here because I'm running out of time, but it's, it's from uh, chapter 23, section one on page 268. And then he continues, right? So this is constant conjunction, as Hume will say. I, we, we find that certain ideas always come together. And then Locke continues, not imagining how these simple ideas can subsist by themselves, we accustom ourselves to suppose some substratum. So we find these ideas always coming together. Therefore, we know empirically that their pow the powers to make us perceive them has al have always come together. But we don't conceive that these powers can be, can, 
subsist by themselves. They must be powers of something. So we think there's something that has both these powers. The thing that has both the powers is the substance. So this means that our general idea of substance is just the idea of something that has powers. And as Locke says, something we know not what. But, and this is the last thing I'm going to say, our idea of a particular type of substance is not um, The key to understanding the idea of any particular type of substance is not this relation of subsistence, but rather this exist relation of coexistence. We, that is, when we form the idea of gold or horse or whatever, so the idea is that something has certain powers, and moreover, if it has this power, it also has this one. So that's why ideas of substances are going to be ideas of necessary coexistence of qualities. Okay, and that's all I have time to say. So I will see you um, Wednesday. Bye.